where the conversation about ballet and the arts can happen. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, we began in September, so we're quite new. We're in a brand new space. Um, we'll be happy to show you around. We have several programs that are already up and running, so I would encourage you to go look at our website to look at those. Some of the that we have planned are on your seats in this uh, on the sheet of paper there. One of the programs that we have is a, and sort of our core program is a fellowship program where we invite scholars and artists to be in residence here and they have an office and support and they do their work here. And these talks sort of grew out of that because they are given mostly by the fellows about the work that they're doing here. Scottish Ballet for 15 years, some of it. Then she went on to do a doctorate at Oxford, and she is now a fellow of St. Hilda's College and uh, the English faculty. Her most recent book is called Literature, Modernism, and Dance, which came out in 2013. Um, wonderful, you should all read it. Uh, the Oxford University Press. And she is here working on a project that's actually very dear to my heart. I love this project. It's called Rewriting Grace in the Modern World. And it's part of an ongoing collaboration that we are developing, also called the Grace Project. Um, and tonight, she's going to talk to us about grace in the 20th century. So, can you tell me? Very, very Association of the Garden of Prosperities, 
which in turn has an association with the Garden of Eden. And we are going to be returning throughout the talk to the idea of the fall um, and the notion of a prelapsarian place, location, where grace abounds. Then, of course, aside from the theology of grace, both the Greek charis and the Latin gratia, both of these versions, have social implications. The secularization of grace takes on political dimensions in terms of social grace, grace and favor. And I thought this would be a good example. Uh, this is, of course, La Carnago in 1730, uh, Lanco's famous painting of La Carnago. And um, all those associations with the origins of classical ballet, uh, which go much, much further back, of course, but we get a sense of um, how the politicization, the socialization of race has been brought in, into, the, into the, um, the social sphere. Okay, so we're going to sit right through to the 20th century. <laughs> this is grace in three easy steps. Um, <laughs> and we reach 1913, Helena in uh, Germany. And of course, it's in Jack Bell Close's um, Dancers Dancing in the Rhythmics. Um, I could easily have put up Louis Fuller, uh, Delsart, Ted Short, Isidore Duncan. You know, and what I'm trying to get at here, as this last slide suggests, is its preoccupation with the Greek dance movement, an early 20th century recovery of the natural grace of the body. This is indeed prelapsarian freedom. What Upton Sinclair in the first chapter of World's End in 1940 pointed to uh, borrowing, I think, from Balanchine, or maybe it was, oh, Balanchine borrowed him? No, I think it was borrowing from Balanchine. He talked about the music made visible of Helena in, in the dance of Helena. But of course, this picture is far from representative of the only interpretation of grace in the 20th century. Remember, of course, the Dark Rose's production of Gluck's Orpheus in 1913 um, comes just before the First World War and closes not with Gluck's Deus Ex Machina, which gave it a happy ending, but with the return of the mourners from Act One. And it's, in a way, the Furies rather than the Graces who dominate this production and curiously anticipate the hell to come in the world. In fact, discussions of the meaning of grace rarely arise in wider explorations of 20th century modernism. If anything, we tend to note the emphasis on something that might be constituted as anti-grace in modernist aesthetics. The idea of the graceless and beleaguered body. Uh, Joyce is pretty keen on that one. The celebration of dislocation, disunity, disharmony and dissonance. But the questioning of and responses to the term race are so complex that what I'll today is just look at a very small section of uh, those responses. So look at a couple of ways in which race is interrogated, uh, rewritten or maybe re-choreographed in the 20th century. And I want particularly to look at the antecedents in the early 19th century of those shifts in thinking towards a repudiation of human grace, as well as its celebration in new, non-human things. I want also to put ballet and dance front and center of this discussion, rather than using it as an afterthought in the intellectual disputes over the meaning and context of the term. Not only does dance help us to think about a certain kind of recovery of grace, but it often identifies the very skepticism we have come to associate with how the celebration of the non-human movement of machines, for example, arises in the modern world, skeptical as it is with divine authority. Grace in the 20th century sometimes returns in the celebration of technology and the machine, and sometimes this shift in authority invokes anxiety and a sense of loss. So I want today to share with you how it was I came to think about this topic at all. And in fact, it was when I was working on Samuel Beckett, surprisingly enough. 
Um, and I was reading Nelson's biography of Beckett and discovered that in 1969, Barbara Gray uh, recommended to him that he read uh, Heinrich von Kleist's Über das Marionettentheater, which was published in 1810, in order to prepare them for the uh, to prepare the actors of his plays for the required style of movement and action of a Beckett drama. Precision and economy, focus on rhythm and timing, attention to the carefully delineation of movements in space. Now, although he only read Kleist in 1969, I thought this is a bit odd, it's quite late for Beckett, really. Um, I suddenly realized that, in fact, he'd already been exposed to the ideas behind the Kleist essay much earlier in the century, in the 1930s when he saw the ballet of Petrushka in London. He saw two separate productions in 1934 and 1935, which would have been stylistically close to the original 1911 staging by the Diagonal of Andalus, uh, with music by Stravinsky, choreography by Philippine, and designs by Bunuan. The scenario was very much initiated by Stravinsky in collaboration with Philippine. <laughs> and uh, sometimes Fokin loses a bit of faith there in, in uh, discussions of you know, who is actually driving the ballet. But it, his part in it is very interesting in the, from the dramaturgical point of view, as we'll see. It's set in St. Petersburg Fairground. I don't really need to tell you all, all the story of Patricia, but you like, no, okay. So, you know, we get the, the, three, the three puppets. Um, backstage as the puppets come alive, the dispute between uh, Petrushka and the Moor for the attraction uh, of their attraction to the ballerina, the spilling over into the public space of the dispute of Petrushka slain by the Moor in front of the curtain uh, of the puppet theatre. The showman tries to diffuse the horrified reactions of the onlookers by demonstrating, you know, Petrushka's only puppet. But in the final moments of the ballet, the ghost of Petrushka reappears, haunting the show. So how is this ballet connected to Kleist? I mean, we might rather think of Adorno or Stravinsky talking about the fundamental, the fundamental category of the grotesque of Petrushka, the contorted, isolated individual offered up. We might think about the Gothic revisitation. Kleist, on the other hand, is um, was a German romantic dramatist and a keen critic of the theater of his day. His essay on the puppet responds in part to romantic ideas about grace, first through Kant and then through Schiller's on gracefulness and dignity, 1793, whose discussion of grace actually endures in a way in modern dance as the moral idea of grace emerges in the practice of Greek dance where harmony of the body and mind is an aid to achieving a state of grace, of physical and spiritual harmony. Kleist's perspective, giving rise to skeptical literary and choreographic responses throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, posed the question of whether the performance of physical grace is humanly possible. In his essay on the public theatre, he introduces the thorny issue of self-consciousness phenomenon that would drive many modernist explorations of identity and um, probably drives a lot of dancers too, thinking about you know, how, how much self-consciousness do we put into this? How, how can we free ourselves from the bounds of conscious thought to really flow, to be in the zone? <coughs> Kleist actually presents a key problem for the ballet dance. He insinuates that for any ballerina, human self-consciousness sets a limitation on what she can possibly achieve in terms of the idea of performance of grace. He is, of course, being ironic to some degree, and Kleist's ambivalent narratorial perspective, in part drawing on 18th century accounts of grace and harmony, produced a highly skeptical interpretation of the relationship between self-consciousness and grace. Only the puppet suggests Kleist and not the ballerina, can move with true grace because it is not subject to the form. 
In short, he argues whether self-consciousness prevents the achievement of grace, and whether the situation may be seen as a curse, a playful conundrum, or as the centre of the puppet master's control over the mechanised object. And it's interesting, at the end of the essay, he actually says, the puppet master dances. It's the puppet master that's doing the dance. So how does this all relate to Petrushka? Um, let's have a look. <laughs> yeah, OK, let's have a little look. Um, I decided just to show you a clip of uh, the bits in the box. <laughs> To get a sense of the, you know, the jerky. I guess the most modern bit is in some way. And, um, mm. we can see how this, uh, this is all being driven by the showman, you know, who's driving the whole thing. It's the Bolshoi, by the way. want to wait to see her do her sweaters. <laughs> oh, can we do? And there's Patricia being prophetic. Um, Andres, okay, I think we'll stop or we'll never get through all this. Um, I want to know how this all relates to Patricia. Well, we need to map, I think, here a few cultural transmissions to get a sense where this argument is going. Allusions to Kaiser say, a, appeared everywhere in European literature, of course, drama and other. E.T.A. Hoffman, of course, is the most obvious, Thomas Mann, Dr. Faustus, Heinrich Heine, Maria Maria Marilke, were conduits of Kleist ideas. And in France, the ballet such as Capella, innovations of the Russian Sevalo Mehol, who absorbed in the German dramaturgs uh, George Buch's attention to the choreographic in physical theatre. So he imports uh, a lot from the um, Künstler Theatre Munich. Mehol's production of Alexander Bloch's The Fairground with Buch in 1906 in St. Petersburg was, um, according to scholars, one of the elusive references that appear in the later Petrushka. Close associations with their whole composing, however, have already been established. Um, actually, no, they have, according to my dates, they will be established. Um, they were developed when Meyerhold appeared in Fokin's ballet Carnaval in 1910. In the same year, Meyerhold produced the innovative Columbine Scarf. If this was a theatre based on a ballet pantomime by Arthur Schweitzer, the veil of Pierrette, in St. Petersburg. Through this work, Mayhold almost certainly introduced Bokin to the idea of a living puppet uh, for Petrushka, based on a Commedia dell'arte figure combined with ideas from Hoffman's tale. And they, um, there's also um, another influence on Petrushka, possibly at this time. Um, not just drawing on the puppet's attainment of self-consciousness through Hoffman and uh, also Edward Gordon Craig and his theory of the Uber marionette, which he published in 1908. And remember that uh, Isadora Duncan introduced him to uh, Craig, to Stanislavski that year. And that he was also highly influenced by Clark. So there are lots of things going on there. I think what Craig says is extremely important for our um, later discussion. If you could make your body into a machine, and if it could obey in every movement for the entire space of time it was before the audience, you would be able to make a work of art out of that which is in you. Think about that for a minute. Today, um, we might think about aspects of William Forsyth or Wayne McGregor's choreography, responding to Craig's dictum uh, with an emphasis on the technology of the body as belonging to this tradition, appearing to privilege the grace of the machine. Um, of course, the puppets 
as we saw here in Patricia, are a kind of earlier incarnation of the theme. But of course, you know, to come back to Beckett and Clarks, um, let's see what Beckett took from um, Patricia. He saw Petrushka just at the right time. He was writing his novel Murphy, uh, uh, which was later published in 1938, and it's the only place where he mentions the name Petrushka. He's talking about Murphy's sense of a split between the physical body and the mind. In the 30s, he was also reading the work of the 17th century Cartesian philosopher Arnold Gerlitz, who was trying to solve the mind-body problem by questioning human self-consciousness in relation to human movement. Because you, because you don't know how the nervous impulses get to the muscles, you don't know how you move, he says. Uh, Gerlang says, I am a mere spectator of a machine whose workings I can neither adjust nor readjust. The whole thing is someone else's effect. So Gerlang's thesis presents the deity as the one who offers a pre-established harmony between mind and body and who sees and knows all things. The gift of God's grace is in some ways the gift of movement. But Murphy in Beckett's novel is nobody's puppet. So Petrushka offered Beckett a dramatization of some of these problems. And remember, um, Petrushka rails against his creator. The questioning of um, authority, that gesture of defiance of authority, uh, where in fact does authority lie, is a, a perennial question for Beckett. And some people, uh, there's a critic, uh, J. Porter Abbott, who called him an autographic writer because he's everywhere at every moment in his own text. Well, let's have a look at scene two of Petrushka, because this, this, is the, this is the scene that I suddenly thought, ah, Beckett. This is where he gets chucked into his box at the end. There, right? Okay. Theatre director and choreographer 
who created the extraordinary Triade de Chevalet in 1922. He celebrated avant-garde design and innovative use of materials to dress his dancing figures um, like puppets. Schlemmer was influenced by both Kleist and Edward Gordon Craig. But then he went on to do uh, a thing called Bauhaus dances. There are a number of different ones. Again, let's have a look at his um, space room, Ram Tanz. Okay. Different forms of movement, yes. 1982, all those years later. And here we had the figures with cowled heads from, uh, they're the hypocrites from uh, Canto 23 of the Inferno. Um, they have no emotion. They just do what they're told. They just start drawing. And they always turn left at the center, which is what happens if you're going down into hell. Okay. <laughs> well, according to Dante, anyway. <laughs> um, and you can, I mean, you can see with the color coding and the quadrat and everything, it seems no accident. And he did this for uh, Stuttgart TV, um, which is where, of course, uh, Oscar Schultz spent quite a lot of time and has uh, a number of his archives housed there. And he has four figures. Oh, I've given it away. There's another one going to appear. I won't make you sit through the whole thing, obviously. <laughs> but it, it's absolutely fascinating to see the floor plan for this in uh, manuscript because he's so like obsessed with the length of steps. Every step had to be something like you know, half a foot. And this he called a dance group. And he recommended that ballet dancers um, be hyped to act in. He wanted people with a high sense of control of their bodies. And he wanted them not to give expressive emotion. Now this is very interesting because in a way, I think once we get, once they all go off stage, we can turn it off. But in a way, what's interesting about it is that Schlemmer still remains part of the expressivist tradition in a way because Schlemmer always said that behind the mask was human consciousness. Beckett says no. Beckett gets rid of the individual expressivist element. Okay. And um, that's not to say that there's no affect or affective response to be got from watching this. But the effect lies with the audience, not in the actors. I think there are some very interesting correlations in teaching dance and, and choreography. We can talk about that later. Okay, let's not go down there. <laughs> yeah, they're nearly all off stage. <laughs> but Beckett being Beckett, where nothing happens twice, <laughs> you'll find that. I mean, this is very interesting wonderful is that we keep anticipating the next move. <laughs> and there they go. They're on again. And it happens again. Okay. Right. Um, in one of the Bauhaus dances of 1926, uh, we, do, we see something slightly different going on. Schlemmer playfully arguing backwards to the manuals on etiquette in the 16th century. And we could even think of something as famous as Castiglione's account of Sprezza Pura and see how it lends something to this discussion. In the courtier in 1528, Pierpaolo the court walk sounds very marionette-like, not to mention evoking laughter in the Bergsonian way, uh, when Bergson wrote the comedy is generated by something mechanical encrusted on the living. 
who is there among you who doesn't laugh when our Pierre Palmer dances in that way of his, as if he were made of wood? And in contrast, we see in many of the men and women that graceful and nonchalant spontaneity, as it is often called, so that those who are watching them imagine that they could have or wouldn't have ever known how to make a mistake. Of course, Clive's reverse versus the hierarchy. The potter is the one with grace, uh, and the human is the one who can't reach grace the value. But um, let's see what he does with this. He plays on the idea of Spumetzatura by applying it to the perfectly graceful puppet of Kleist's picture. 1926, again, this is another Bauhaus dance. I'm sorry, I don't know who the music is on. This is a reconstruction by Margaret Hastings in the 70s. She was a British scholar who <coughs> researched all of um, Schleimer's notes for the idea I just think this is wonderful. The idea of a Morton dance and this extraordinary get up. Any expression or gesture, really. There is a kind of tenderness about it, though, and I think Schlemmer was particularly interested in uh, exploring genre. How do you create comedy? How do you create tragedy? How do you create tenderness? Okay. Oh yes, we have to see her do a little bit of It's very exact. Alright. I suppose we should let them come back to Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so, now we're going to take a slightly different direction. The question of who controls the puppet. Um, and I think we can think about you know, 20th century futurist, constructivist art, uh, which celebrates and also worries about the ditching of both human and divine autonomy in favor of the authority of the machine. We get some pro and some against. Um, and let's have a, now if any of you are really photosensitive, uh, look away at this point. <laughs> okay because um, we're now going to look at the uh, Dadais, 1954 Dadais film, Ballet Mechanique. Uh, Development of the first time emotion studies. You know, there's a whole thing in Tennessee 
Arabs written about machine dances and, um, <laughs> and the relationship also between you know Hollywood uh, uh, choruses and so on and the kind of idea of repetition and which you know has a graceful uh, element to it. Okay, and of course uh, Adolf Bohm also did um, uh, a ballet mechanic here, or oh, rather in California, in uh, 1932, with music by A. Vasodov. Um, and characters there included principal dynamos, switches, gears, flywheels, with entrechats with the opening and closing spring valves. So, where we get the idea of celebration. Okay. A very quick look now. How am I doing for time? I'm running out. Ten minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> A quick look at no guesses. A darker critique of the factory machine race. Um, oh no, it's not. This is Schleimer again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Project of 2014. 
Conrad drew inspiration from the mathematician Ada Lovelace, whose work with inventor Charles Babbage is heralded as among the very first in proto-computer programming. For Conrad Shawcross's uh, Ada project, you had four female composers invited to create compositions in response to a dancing robot programmed by the artist himself, by uh, Shawcross. The idea was to reverse the traditional commissioning process. Rather than a machine responding to music, instead the machine is the primary source of inspiration. Okay, let's hear it. Theory of the movement, the physicality, the emotional sort of pathos and levels in which it works, the ratios in which drives the movement and the geometry. Um, so the artists are forced to put in this kind of constrained box where they have to basically come up with a piece of music that would fit the psychology and the mood of the, of the robot. And in that sense, it's a little bit like early jazz where it responded to the, to the rhythm of the factory or the rhythm of the train. These things that were set. Two here. 
I think you're first, Rachel, yeah. I am curious about how your previous book, I was a book junior. Yeah. You talk about the chain of Yeah, yeah, yeah. And whether you're going to talk about the Athelian and rationality vis-a-vis -vis this, this fascinating exploration of the sheep and the race. <laughs> Well, yes, I would. If I had more time, I would have got it. No, I mean, in the book. <laughs> oh, in the, the book, book that I come up Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it is absolutely uh, unattestable because of um, <laughs> you can't really talk about anything in, these, in dance in the, 20th, in the early 20th century without thinking about uh, the birth of tragedy. Right? You know, I really, I really think <laughs> that is. Would you agree, Tabitha? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and therefore, the idea of this kind of platonic arising, you know, um, the return of that, but also the return of the idea of a community, I think is very fascinating in relation to the representation of grace through the Greek dance movement and, and so on. But the idea of the rationality of the Apollonian, it's almost as if the machines have become super Apollonian. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not all of the studies. Yeah. Do you have a group? Do you have a. Uh, do you like it? I mean, do you think like this is. I, I, I don't know how to phrase it. I mean, it's just, there are people who are very uh, upset about the fact that there is this. I know. Super oh. technologization.
when I saw this. I had gone along thinking, I'm not going to want to see these bodies that are all, you know, they're just machines. It, but he didn't, but neither of them actually had the, the dancers act as machines. They, he, they weren't using them exactly as machines. They used them in some ways in the way that Beckett is using a um, non-effective mover, a non-effective actor. Somebody who doesn't involve their own subjective personality. I mean, Murray Rombe, I think, put it brilliantly when she talked about Mijinsky, saying that he never had the same personality on stage as he did off stage. He was like some other self. He was always what it was he was performing. He transcended. So, in a, I mean, in a, at the very end of that trajectory, I think one could say, not that he becomes a machine, but that he becomes uh, a conduit, a vessel. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I have a bunch of questions, but uh, one thing that I'm struck by is that when you say conduit, you go back to the sort of original idea of great, the, the, uh, the theological idea of great, you know, the this vessel, or, you know, of, of spirit. And I think that what the, what distinguishes uh, that from mechanism is that a mechanism is self, it's, it's autonomous, it's self-generative. It doesn't, it, 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 it you, you get it going. When someone says, we do this, somebody gets mechanical. But you can do it too. It can be a momentum thing. That is to say, like if you watch, if you watch Barishnikov and he's very young, he's doing Don Quixote, and he's he's doing that that thing where they do the fouet, and then yeah, the yeah. attitude, and then the attitude yes spins itself. Yeah, right, yeah, and yeah, then he starts it again. Yes. There's a moment of will, and then the will is, I mean, he's generating it, and then it becomes a mechanism, and then he becomes a person, and then he becomes a mechanism. Love it. That's great. And I think that like, and so so. Okay, so those are two things. One is that you might think of a mechanism as being something that at a certain point is not generated by anyone, but it, it has its own momentum, and that's what distinguishes it from what we call when someone is inspired, or when they're, they're visited, or possessed, or whatever you want to say, it, as being a, a different kind of uh, non-ego-driven uh, thing. That's the first thing. The second thing, is, which is related to it, when you say that uh, when you talk about, I, I'm curious and, and a little bit skeptical about the idea that machine dance is something that came up with modernism rather than the other way around. That is that dance, because it's something that we create on our own bodies, necessarily is has these ends of the mechanical and the, and the spiritual yeah. embedded in it, and that it proceeds, yeah. it proceeds Hoffman and Christ and et cetera. Well, yes, it does. I, I, I agree with you completely. It's just that I've got to start somewhere. You know, I actually mentioned a couple of examples of, uh, you know, the precedents. Yeah. So what changed at the point when it, when you started? Did it become more conscious? Was it more related to industrialization? I mean, yes, yeah, absolutely. As, as I feel that Marinetti was, um, you know, was, was highly influential. Yeah. What's in, that? In, in, um, in celebrating technology, you know, in showing that that, that art could celebrate technology oh, rather than just denigrate it. Okay. I mean, he had he did he had things like the aircraft dance or things, didn't he? Where you had to lie down flat on the floor and if you put your arms up and propel. Oh, why Marinetti thought that that wasn't magnetic? I don't know. But. You seem to think that that was a good example of, of how you might dance you know, as a machine. Uh, in fact, it's just being pretending to be a machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. So that they can get over the top Absolutely. Yeah, that's nice to have. Uh, I, I've had them as kind of hand up for years. I'm sorry, at the beginning, was it, you were playing? I'm sorry, go ahead. It's all right. Well, listen, I just had one word to say. I, that was incredible. Um, but Sue, you know, you said, uh, you said, I heard you shifts in authority cause anxiety. And it's such a, and while you're talking, you know, and some of us are of an age, we can remember when Balanchine was thought to be soulless. 
that the repetition, yeah. that the machine quality, that we were soulless. That in fact, yeah. I was told in California, no, don't go work for, for balancing, he has no soul. And at the basis of much of his choreography is repetition. Is, uh, you know, the memory thing you're talking about, is the beauty of this, and we're encountering that today. People are so scared of like, the greater intelligence of machine being told that this will happen. It is very anxiety. I loved your words. I love those words. Anxiety, the authority thing. Yeah. It's fabulous. Thank you. I think that's that, and that goes back to the question about why I'm why I'm starting then that theory because I think that particular anxiety comes up then. Yeah. So. Oh yes. Um, at the beginning, you asked us what is grace. Yeah. I, I think I would have said beauty and movement. And you took us this incredible adventure. Where did you come out? <laughs> I'm smaller. <laughs> I don't know. I think I just. I, um, I think the verdict is out. I'm going to dodge it. I think I come out. <laughs> I think I come out on beauty and movement. Even when it's ugly movement, it's, you know, it's kind of. Yeah. Oh no, I was going to say, uh, I thought part of the thing was rewriting grace. Yeah. The, so that, that the idea that can include things that are automatic. Or, yeah. You know, it, it's not all ugly. Yeah, there are parts Exactly. Of it. Um, exactly. And of course, there's a huge drive to rewrite. What grace means, what, you know, what and how, how, how you can include technology in a, in a way that is soulful. We have to use it ourselves. Yeah, and I mean, I was, you know, that's absolutely right, um, Susanna. We, we were laughing at Ezra Pound and his, you know, after war kind of comments. But in a way, that's what he was trying to do. You know, he was trying to find and take something good out of this, yeah. you know, to show the ways in which, okay, we, you know, this could be exciting. Um, it's, it, you know, we have to watch out.